Ibn al-Haytham, the father of science. Hey, welcome everybody. This is Stefan, author of In Search of the Sublime. You can read the book for free on worldhistorybook.com. Now let's start. At university, I was taught that the first person to develop the scientific method was Francis Bacon in the 16th century. To be sure, Bacon's description is superb and it helped spark the scientific revolution in Europe. But to my surprise, many of the main tenets of scientific inquiry can also be found in a work from medieval Islam called The Book of Optics by the scientist Ibn al-Haytham. Al-Haytham explained how difficult it is, even for the greatest geniuses among us, to attain credible knowledge. To give a modern example, think about how confused scientists today are about, say, diet, Different scientists, all with good track records, often come to the complete opposite conclusion. And this was also once true, as we shall see in this lecture, for theories that are now well established. Al-Haytham helped to solve this problem. He tells us for the first time in world history that true understanding can only come through systematic experimentation. Let's now study his ideas. The medieval scientist Al-Haytham, who lived in the 10th and 11th century, was born in Iraq in the Islamic Middle Ages. We also call this period the Islamic Golden Age. For at the time, when medieval Europe had not yet recovered from the fall of Rome, the Middle East produced the greatest scientific output in the world. Let's now start with some background information about Ibn Al-Haytham. We are told that Ibn al-Haytham attempted to build a hydraulic system to regulate the annual flooding of the Nile. But when this plan failed, he had to fear for his life since the Caliph of Egypt at the time, nicknamed Hakim the Mad, had a violent temper. To save his life, al-Haytham decided to pretend that he had gone mad. The plan worked, although he did have to spend the rest of his life under house arrest. Yet at home in his library, he wrote his most important scientific works. al Haytham's most famous work is his Book of Optics, which became very influential, both in the Arabic world and also later in the West. To give you an idea what this book looked like, let's flip to some pages. As you can see, his pages are filled with all kinds of geometric constructions, often representing reflecting light rays. And here we see a handwritten medieval Latin version. And here another beautiful version. Another one. And here we see the first printed version. Above the page we see the name Alhazen, which is the Western variant of Alhaytham. And this book also includes some beautiful pictures representing reflection and also again those complicated geometrical images. Al-Haytham's Book of Optics was clearly inspired by a Greek text called The Optics by the great scientist and astronomer Ptolemy. Ptolemy too had done some experiments, actually the first experiments in history, and I talk about these in an earlier lecture. But Al-Haytham's work surpassed Ptolemy's optics in various ways. For Al-Haytham's Book of Optics, unlike any other book written up to that point, reads like a scientific text. In his book, he took small, careful steps, sticking close to sensory evidence. Even more so than the optics of Ptolemy, the work is packed with experimental demonstrations, allowing the reader to confirm every step by repeating these experiments for himself. Crucially, Al-Haytham also used language to indicate that he was performing experiments as opposed to passive observation, as the Greek philosopher Aristotle had recommended. For this, he used the Arabic word itabar, which medieval Europeans later translated in experimentum. Al-Haytham also described his own methodology in surprisingly modern terms. For instance, he acknowledged the difficulty of gaining accurate knowledge and the fallibility of human thinking. Let's read some of his quotes. He said, Certainty is difficult to achieve, for the truths are obscure 
the ends hidden, the doubts manifold, the minds turbid, the reasonings various. The premises are gleaned from the senses, and the senses, which are our only tools, are not immune from error. The inquirer or the scientist, however diligent, is not infallible. The only way to overcome this problem, he then adds, is to critique scientific theories relentlessly. He said, to find the truth is hard, and the way to it is rough. For the truths are immersed in uncertainties, and all men are naturally inclined to have faith in the scientists. But God has not protected scientists from error, nor has he made their science immune from shortcomings and defects. Had this not been the case, they would not have disagreed about anything in the sciences, nor would their opinions have differed in regard to the true nature of things. But the facts are otherwise. Scientists do disagree and they cannot all be right. So we must carefully criticize their work. He continues, the seeker after the truth is not one who studies the writing of the ancients and following his natural dispositions just puts his trust in them but rather the one who suspects his faith in them and questions what he gathers from them. He is the one who submits to argument and demonstration and not to the sayings of a human being whose nature is fraught with all kinds of imperfections and deficiency. And we continue, thus the duty of man who investigates the writing of the scientists, if learning the truth is his goal, is to make himself an enemy of all that he reads and to attack it from every side. He should also suspect himself as he performs his critical examination of it, so that he may avoid falling either into prejudice or leniency. In the same vein, Al-Haytham also warned against, quote, believing in Ptolemy's work in everything he says without relying on a demonstration or calling on a proof. Very modern way of phrasing things. He then continued, that is how experts in the prophetic tradition or in religion have faith in the prophets. May the blessing of God be upon them. But it is not the way that mathematicians or scientists have faith in the specialists in the demonstrative sciences. Believing what you are told is something for religion, not for science, he says. To further understand how he applied his method, we need to know some basics about optics. In ancient Greece, there had been two competing theories on vision. The first was the emission theory, which held that vision worked by the eye emitting vision rays that sort of felt the environment somewhat like the antenna of insects. This might sound a bit ridiculous to the modern reader, but it was supported by great thinkers, including Euclid and Ptolemy. And on top of this, the theory also isn't completely without merit. For Euclid believed that those vision rays were emitted in the shape of a cone. And since the radius of this cone becomes larger with distance, this allowed him to understand mathematically why objects look smaller when they are further away. So said in a different way, it explained perspective. And you can see this in the image below. The atomists didn't agree. They thought that all objects instead emit atoms and that these atoms made visible images when they entered our eyes. Yet that model could not explain how atoms from say an entire mountain could fit into someone's eye. And the atomist also couldn't explain how objects could continuously send out atoms without reducing in size. Of course, the ancients also knew that light had something to do with vision, but they didn't know exactly how. Ptolemy, for instance, believed that light only brightens surfaces, but we then needed those extra vision rays to actually see those objects. So light was only to brighten up the objects so that the vision rays could then see them. A very curious way of thinking from a modern perspective. 
But this shows you how difficult it is, even for the greatest geniuses, to understand the world. And that was exactly Al Haytham's point. Al Haytham summarized their positions as follows. He says, the natural scientist settled upon the opinion that vision is affected by a form or atoms which come from visual objects to the eye and through which sight perceives the form of the object. Mathematicians, in contrast, agree that vision is affected by a ray which issues from the eye to the visual object and by means of which sight perceives the object. These notions, he then continued, I mean the opinion of the physicist and the mathematician, appear to diverge and contradict one another if taken at face value. So, he concluded, they cannot both be right. And in fact, Ibn al-Haytham showed that both theories were wrong. He set out to establish his own theory based on small experiments. He started by demonstrating that we can see an object if we can visualize an unobstructed straight line between that object and our eyes. That is the first clue. He sets out to demonstrate this meticulously using rulers and siding tubes. He then showed that light also moves in straight lines, as you can see, for instance, by poking a hole in a dusty dark chamber, revealing straight light rays, as you can see in the image. So both the vision rays and the light rays seem to move in straight lines. That cannot be a coincidence. He then showed that objects can only be seen if light from an object enters our eyes either because the object emits light by itself or because it reflects light from another source. He then also pointed to the ability of bright light to cause pain in our eyes, even when this bright light is seen through a mirror. This also proves that light enters the eyes when we see an object. From all these small experiments, he concluded that vision rays were redundant. We do not need them. Everything could be explained through light rays alone. To further take apart Euclid's emission theory, he used the following thought experiment. Imagine looking upward at the night sky, but with your eyes closed. When you open your eyes, stars become immediately visible. In Euclid's theory, this would mean that those rays emitting from the eyes would instantly fill the entire universe, which is of course nonsensical. But Ibn al-Haytham did want to maintain the advantages of Euclid's cone theory, since it explained perspective so well. His solution was to assume that those vision rays are not emitted from the eyes in the cone shape, but that light enters the eyes in the same cone shape. And this theory is still in use today. And that was the theory of Ibn al-Haytham. Let's now move two centuries forward in time. Another early scientist worth noting from the Arabic world was Al-Fasiri, who wrote a commentary on Al-Haytham's optics, in which he gave a description of the rainbow. He demonstrated his theory of the rainbow by studying how light propagates in a glass sphere filled with water, which he used as a model of a water droplet in the atmosphere. This is perhaps the first use of a model to understand a scientific phenomenon which also became one of the hallmarks of science. The scientific mindset eventually arrived in Europe in the 13th century. There, Roger Bacon, for instance, conducted experiments with magnifying glasses and burning mirrors. Pierre de Maricourt also did experiments, but this time with magnets. And a little later, in the 16th century, Galileo conducted experiments to describe falling objects. The next great step in the formulation of the scientific method came with Francis Bacon, also in the 16th century. Francis managed to convince the scientific community to take on his ideas, sparking the scientific revolution. But well, that will be the topic for the next lecture. I hope you've learned a lot so far. If you want to know more, read my book, In Search of the Sublime. You can read it all for free on worldhistorybook.com. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.